Dealing with magnets can be so frustrating. They stick to steel all day, and without a convenient handle, they're just impossible to remove. It's enough to make you want to tear your hair out. Until now. For only 10 easy payments of $500, plus separate shipping and handling, you can buy the tools necessary to make your magnets magical. Trust me, you'll be glad you did. Hi everyone. I figured I'd take a break from playing Animal Crossing and make the best kind of machining project. One where the dimensions don't matter in the slightest. Besides, I really needed a much better way of doing magnets in my shop. I wanted to go with something kind of like a thumbtack where I could grab it and pull it off, and this is what I came up with. The dimensions for these are based purely on the size of these magnets. These are magnets from Harbor Freight Tools. They're real cheap. You get 10 of them. And they measure in around 5 sixteenths or 8 millimeters in diameter and about 78 thousandths or 2 millimeters thick. Here is my very hastily drawn print. And like I said, the only thing that really matters is the size of the pocket for the magnets and a little bit on this collar here. This measurement doesn't really matter too much, just as long as it's consistent between the pieces, because I'm going to make a collar that clamps onto that so I can hold the part for boring that pocket later. Besides that, the parts dimensions were all just based on the stock that I had, which was 7 16 diameter aluminum, and uh, then just what looked good. The tip doesn't really need to be a ball, it could be anything. Uh, I just thought it would be grippy enough that I'd be able to take it off, and it gives me a chance to show off making and using a form tool. The tip could easily be a cylinder or a disc or something pointy, just as long as you can grab onto it. And of course, all of these dimensions can be scaled to suit your needs. Maybe you've got larger magnets, or perhaps you've got a spare jewel, or a long furry tail that you'd like to add onto this thing. To start the form tool, I colored the end of a piece of high-speed steel with a black permanent marker, and I'm going to scribe the shape that I want on the end of this. You could use radius gauges for this, but in my case I'm just going to use the tip of a quick disconnect air fitting. It's the right size and uh, th there's nothing critical about this. I'm just putting it down against the high speed steel and I'm going to describe around the circumference of it. Then I'm going to go to the bench grinder and grind all that material away. Form tools are relatively simple to make, but at the same time you need to be relatively precise with the shape. Any flaws that are left in the tool are going to show up in the finished product, so it has to be pretty smooth. You also have to make sure that you have enough clearance for your relief angles. You don't need to have any back rake, but you need to have end and side relief. To set up for making the form tool, I put a quarter inch parallel in here, and then I've got a five degree angle block. I'm putting that there so that I can angle the piece and get my clearance angle. I've already gone through and made this tool, this is a recreation of my setup, uh, but what I did was go to the bench grinder and grind away all this excess material down to my line or a little bit shy of my line, and then uh, this operation is just smoothing out the surface. This is one of the many reasons to keep worn out carbide end mills around. Carbide is harder than high speed steel, so it will cut it. It won't particularly like cutting it, but it'll do it. This cutter is already pretty messed up on the end, and after this operation, it's going to be pretty well and truly screwed over. And that's totally okay. This is what I keep junk carbide end mills for. Uh, they're going to wear out over time, and you might as well try to squeeze out the last little bit of use out of them while you can. I'm going to take out the angle block and the parallel after this. They're going to vibrate loose in this cut, and I don't particularly want to machine into those. I'm not going to be taking a very heavy cut, I'm just moving it in until it uh, just kisses the surface and cleans up the very edge of the cutter and makes it nice and smooth. Like I said, carbide cutters do not particularly enjoy cutting high speed steel, so if you're not already wearing hearing protection in your shop, you should definitely wear them here. This is the finished form tool, and as you can see, I took it over to the bench grinder and I removed as much material as I possibly could and gave myself plenty of side relief because that's the one thing you're not going to get machining this on the mill. 
Of course, on the bench grinder, it's very difficult to actually get a smooth surface, which is why I brought it over to the mill and just cleaned up this top edge. This makes it nice and round, and of course you could easily do this with a properly sized stone and a die grinder as well. Now let's get down to business. I already set the diameter on this by touching off on the stock. This is actually my second piece. Like I said, this doesn't really matter as far as dimensions, so I just touched off on the stock and set it as the nominal dimension, and then I moved right into just larger than 5 sixteenths of an inch. I went up to 315 thousandths. That's going to give me a little bit to clear up with the form tool. When I bring up the form tool, I'm going to want to touch off on the edge just to make sure that I'm relatively consistent in my location. Then to make it a little bit easier to see when the ball is complete, I'll take my black sharpie and just color in the diameter of the stock. Once the black disappears, then I know that my ball's finished. Normally when you're running a form tool, you want to run it a good bit slower because of the increased contact between the tool and the part, and you also want to generally use oil. But this is aluminum, and that's uh, one of the big reasons why I chose aluminum for this project. I didn't want to have to continually be changing speeds on my lathe. I didn't bother measuring the diameter of this ball. Like I said, nothing on this really matters besides the pocket for the magnet. I then switched back to my original tool, and I still haven't changed anything with the x-axis on here, but I did touch off on that tiny shoulder at the end of the ball, and that's going to give me a datum for cutting the rest of this step on the little stem. I'm just plowing through here until I get to my 375 dimension, my 3 8 dimension. Uh, I actually stopped a little bit shy of that, so I can make sure that on my last pass, I got right up to 375, so I'd get a nice clean shoulder. My second pass brought it all the way down to 200 thousandths of an inch, so it left a fair amount of material to remove for a finish pass. And uh, after moving up to my shoulder, I just went all the way up to the ball, and you'll see me stop pretty much right where it blends in with the ball. So I end up with a little bit of a taper there at the end, uh, and it's pretty aesthetically pleasing. If you wanted to make these, you don't really need to do a form tool. You could easily do something like this with a file and just freehand it. I just wanted them to look a little bit more consistent between the pieces because I made six of these. Once that's done, I just move out a little bit from the ball, plunge in the rest of the way down to my target diameter, and I do the exact same thing. Blend in with the ball on one side, and then feed across and go all the way up to my shoulder. This time though I go all the way in to 0.375 on my digital readout and of course you could be using a dial indicator for this as well and then uh, just pull straight out so I get a nice square shoulder. Then I'm going to come in with a file and knock the edge off of that shoulder. Um, I don't want to feel that when I'm using it of course and uh, it's always good practice to deburr your parts on the machine. It's a lot easier then than afterwards. And I'm setting up my parting tool and I just want to get my edge of my parting tool uh, right at the shoulder. Again, not critical, so I'm just using another high speed steel blank and uh, holding it tight against the shoulder and bumping up the edge of my parting tool against that. Then I can zero my DRO and move in to the dimension that I want. Before I part it off though, I'm going to come in with some scotch Brite and give it a little bit of a brushed finish. And I'm going to do this on the uh, outside diameter of the stock as well, not just the machined portion. That way it's very uniform in its appearance. And I'm just going to put a little dab of oil on there and use my parting tool. Uh, this parting tool is just a high speed steel blade that I've ground an angle on the end, so it leaves a minimum of a burr on the part. When I flip it around for the second operation, I'm, I'm going to face it and then bore it out for the magnet. So it won't really matter if there is a huge burr, but I, I generally like to uh, leave as little of one on the finished part as possible. This kind of parting tool is really fantastic for cutting off tubing, by the way, because you don't leave a large burr. I'm sure many of you will be wondering why I didn't bore out the part first and then turn the rest of everything. That's because I would only be gripping on to a very small portion of this material, and all of these cuts would be rather forceful. It would, uh, between the form tool and then 
cutting away from the headstock, it would really want to pull out from the collet, and I, I didn't particularly want to uh, subject myself to that, especially since I'd only be gripping onto about an eighth of an inch or three millimeters of material. That's why I turned down all of the other features of the part first, and now I'm going to make a collar that's going to fit onto the cylindrical section here. That's going to be made out of the same parent material as the original piece, and I'm just going to drill a hole and cut it in half, and then we'll be able to hold it in the exact same collet. This is a pretty standard operation, just a spot drill, and then I drilled with a number 11 drill, which will make a nice snug fit on the dimension where the stem actually ended up. The nominal dimension is 375, but I made the collar 300 thousandths long because of the taper right there where it blends into the ball. I didn't want there to be any binding, so I'm going to make sure before I finish cutting it off that that actually does fit in the allotted space. Before I part it off the entire way, I'm going to break the edges with the file, and then just clean up the outside a little bit with the Scotch-Brite. Now that that's done, I'll just deburr the holes and then bring it over to the vise off camera and cut it in half. Basically, I'm just going to clamp it in the vise and then saw it right down the middle axis right there. We've got our split collar made and there's a difference in surface finish between the two sides, so that's how I'm going to tell them apart. You could also easily just color in one end with a sharpie and that would be equally effective. This is all to make sure that it holds onto the stem in a consistent way and that it's actually still going to fit into the collet. The two halves are just going to go around the stem of the part and you can see right here that it forms that 7 16th diameter circle and you can hold that in a collet now and bore that end. For the boring, I'm using an end mill that's being held in an ER32 collet chuck. This is just a straight shank ER collet chuck that you can get from a lot of different vendors and I'm holding it in a boring bar holder that goes into my quick change tool post. End mills actually make really effective boring bars because you can plunge straight into solid work first. You just need to make sure that the cutting lips are straight in line with the axis of the lathe. You also need to make sure that your center height is absolutely spot on as well as your side to side location. You have to be able to find the center of the part otherwise you're going to have cutting issues. You'll find the side to side location the same way you would with any tool. You touch off on the outside. Then in this case you're going to move in half the diameter of the end mill and half the diameter of the stock as well. One quick note to think about here is whether your dials or your digital readout are reading on the radius or the diameter. Most of the time, your digital readout especially will be reading on the diameter for the x-axis. In that case, you'll have to move the display in the full diameter of the end mill and the full diameter of the stock in order to get it onto center. Otherwise, you're way off, and luckily, that's very visually apparent. I'm telling you that from experience because it actually happened when I was setting up for this part. I'm just not going to waste your time by putting it in the finished film. Once this is all set up, it's a simple matter of just plunging straight in, and I make my first cut on the center line and then just move my end mill out and bore to final size. Finally, I just mix up some epoxy and start putting the magnets in. I made six of these and I made a big mistake in using five minute epoxy for this job. I really should have used an epoxy with a longer set time because by the time I reached the sixth part that I had made, the epoxy was already setting up and it really didn't work out so well. I had to end up scraping a bunch of epoxy out and uh, that one ended up being really, really messy. The magnet ended up being really crooked inside it and I've uh, decided to keep it on my fridge as a testament to my inadequacies. To help keep track of these while they were setting up, I grabbed a piece of scrap steel and put a piece of parchment paper on it. That's going to keep the epoxy from gluing the magnet to the steel as well, but it has the added advantage of keeping the magnet right at the face of the handle rather than sunken in. That way I know that I'm going to get a nice, strong, consistent hold out of the magnets. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please consider hitting the like and subscribe buttons. If you have any questions or inappropriate jokes, please leave them down in the comments section below. Thanks for watching, 
I'll see you next time. But wait, there's more! She's gone! I'm proud of her!